kind of did see that part coming. I just kind of felt so proud of myself, you know. Hi everyone and welcome to episode 11 of the Audiobook Club podcast. I'm here today with my two hosts, Jonathan and Stephen. Do you guys want to say hello? Hello. Hey. Yeah, and today we will be reviewing and talking about uh, Rivers of London. And I'm sorry to take away anybody's trivia if this was part of your trivia, but I'm just I, it would annoy me if I don't mention this straight away. It also has another title in America. Uh, it's called Midnight Riot. Uh, so, trivia thief. Yeah. <laughs> but before we talk about that, um, guess we'll, we'll we'll go on to a bit of news. Uh, so, a Florida high school has pulled a graphic novel adaptation of Anne Frank's Diary, saying it's not age appropriate. Um, this kind of feeds into our hold censorship debate that we've been having over the past few weeks it's the fact i think the the fact that makes this so insulting is the fact that anne frank herself was such a young girl you know to try and safeguard young people from this from from this content of this horrific thing that happened just i don't know how do you how do you guys feel about that do you have any opinions on it well, there's a few few things that unpack there so like graphic novel like what's uh, i'm curious to actually see the graphics myself and see what it you know why it was if, why it was um removed like what's the what's the problem i can guess but i you know i'd like to see it it's kind of weird though like i mean uh, i don't know yeah uh i've never actually read the book to be honest but um I know, I know about the book from you know pop culture references. Really, um, hmm. what do you think about that, Jonathan? Do you have any strong opinions? Um, I mean, yeah, again, I guess it is written by well, what age was Anne Frank when she wrote it? Um, let me just actually Google um about the book. She was uh, fifteen when she died. Uh, for uh, so thirteen years old, I think it's saying here when she wrote her diary. She was, because uh, she was hiding for two years, so I guess she was 13 when she started it, and then, like, I don't know how how long she actually, like, wrote it for. I guess she wrote it for the whole of those two years, like. Yeah. I mean, I'm looking at pictures, like, and it, it is pretty graphic, some of them, <laughs> but. Oh, I mean, really? Graphic? Says, in what he, way? What's it depicting? Well, there's a picture of, uh, uh, what do you call it? Um, glass knot. You know, the. The thing where they broke all the shop windows now, and uh, so it's violently yeah. graphic. Like that's it's, then there's a picture of like a, a dead guy, blood coming on him, and there's a Nazi with a truncheon standing there. So it is quite violent. But I mean, when it says age appropriate. Who, who's a target of that? You know what I mean? Like what? If someone's reading this book when they're under whatever the age, I'm, I'm assuming like whatever age they're trying to make this appropriate for, like. If they're reading this book, they've decided they choose that they read the diary. They aren't frankly probably mature enough to understand what they're saying. Yeah. Like, I mean, this isn't like a book that some child's going to pick up going like, oh, this is lethal. Do you know what I mean? This is like, you're probably usually doing this in like an English class or something, you know. You're doing it in like a professional setting. So like, I mean. Uh, Also, just to correct myself there, it's crystal knot, not uh, glass knot. I don't know where I got that from. So uh, the first point that I also wanted to bring up well before getting into the book after news was uh it was actually it actually no longer applies because I was going to say that there are now now four of us but Jason still has not joined us I was gonna say that we have we have gone from a trio uh, and now that there's four of us um which one of which one of us would be Ringo but you know I can't I can't make that joke anymore uh I think Jason would be Paul anyway because he's He's probably dead. So. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus. Fuck. That's a lot. Jesus. Paul's actually Paul's actually alive, but there's like uh, Paul's the only one that's alive. The, consp- the conspiracy theory. 
I've seen the theory. I've seen, I love that theory, to be honest. It's it's just so fascinating. was actually replaced by a fake. He was replaced by a, a lookalike that was like, a, he won a contest, a Paul uh, lookalike contest, and they... Um, he died and they, they was Doesn't they do the same, say the same thing about Avril Lavigne recently? Like, is this not just something that happens to these celebrities? Like, uh, but is she not uh, like a, an android or something? <laughs> like Eminem as well? He's another one. Is Ringo Starr not alive too? I thought it was Ringo and Paul. No, Ringo Starr. Uh, yeah. George Harrison and John are the two that died. Ah, uh, yes. Yeah, Ringo and Paul are alive, yeah. Yeah. But uh, enough. Uh, Enough chat and shite. Let's uh, <laughs> let's get on to the. Well, I I I want to go more into that. And just talk about that theory more because it's it's fascinating. <laughs> to we'll, be do a, we'll do a podcast on the as Paul really dead. As Paul was, dead. <laughs> was he replaced? I don't think he is. Like I th- I I, I want to believe that the band did that on purpose to like put it out there. Like a crazy story. Sounds like a like that an unsaid joke. Just like they're just like oh, we'll just tell it on Paul's dead. Like, <laughs> yeah, it's like look at the album covers. There's what what is it? Abbey Road and uh, uh, Sergeant Pepper's. Um, make references to Paul being dead. Yeah. Uh, are you are you guys big Beatles fans? Like, if I was to ask you, would you have a favorite album? Would that would you be able to answer that? Would that? See, I don't. I don't. I don't have a favorite. I I would say I'm a Beatles fan, yeah, but I don't think I have a favorite album because yeah. there's so many good songs. It's hard yeah. to. I like I, to I like uh, Abbey Road. I think it's like the most. Uh, I think it, it is the last album they ever reco- uh, recorded together, wasn't it? I mean, Let It Be came out after, but I think I've heard that Abbey Road was recorded after Let It Be, and it does like their it does sound the most mature songwriting, it's and it's really. So... Yeah, I know. Abbey, I think Abbey Road was released in 1969, and Let It Be was in 1970, I think. And then they all went on to their solo careers. Well, I'm I'm just curious about like uh, who you think me and Jonathan are, and if, if think, Jason's Paul. I think we? I think that I should be George Harrison because he was the first to start a solo career, and I've gone off. Here we done, go, Johnny. Done, who's he gonna my, say is Ringo? Done my solo podcast. So, um, one of you's John and one's Ringo. Um, I don't know. What do you guys think? Well, my name's Jonathan. Like that's <laughs> if that's not a reason, I don't. I don't know what it is like. Fine, I'll be Ringo then. I'll, <laughs> I'll accept Ringo. Like it's fine. But nobody send me any fan mail. <laughs> I love my fans, but no fan mail. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, as I said, uh, we are doing Rivers of London today by Ben Aronovich, read by Kobna Holbrook-Smith. Um, just a bit about the novel, I'm just going to read this straight from Wikipedia. The novel centres on the adventures of Peter Grant, a young officer in the Metropolitan Place, who, following on an unexpected encounter with a ghost, is recruited into the small branch of the Met that deals with magic and the supernatural. Peter Grant, having become the first English apprentice wizard in over 70 years, must immediately deal with two different but ultimately related cases. In one, he must find what is possessing ordinary people and turning them into vicious killers. And in the second, he must broker a peace between two warring gods of the River Thames and their respective families. Uh, So a bit about why I picked this book. Um... Back when I first read this, I was kind of branching out into uh, crime and thriller books. I think Stephen said previously on this podcast it's something that he was looking to do. It was uh, also a a lane that I went down as well. And it it also came at a time when I was really loving the BBC Sherlock series. I was a huge fan of that and and kind of, and, and I just had this thought. I was like, I wish there was like a fantasy, urban fantasy, magical realism version of this. And so I, I kind of wondered, does anything like that exist? So I, I was searching around and it brought me to two series. One was the Dresden Files and the other was the Peter Grant series. So I've read a few books from each of these series. Uh, I have a few issues with the Dresden Files. Um, a common complaint about it is people find the first books a bit, bit neckbeardy. You know, uh, <laughs> that, it's, it's just the perfect way to describe them, I think, in the first couple of books. 
but I've heard those books do get better as the series progresses. So it is a, a series I want to revisit eventually and give it another chance. But I want to talk about why I recommend this first. So when I first read this, I, I really loved this series. It was exactly what I was looking for. Um, Peter isn't the same as Sherlock Holmes, obviously. He's more of a working class cop, more, uh, more than this brilliant kind of uh, recluse. But... I kind of I kind of really liked that take on it as well, and um, just like when I was learning how to write to all the books that I read, uh, usually I break it down into three different components of plot, character, and setting, and of course, like these different components are usually interwoven, and you can add different things as well on top of this, like theme and symbolism. But just to keep it simple, I usually think of stories and and these three markers: plot, character, and setting. And for me, this uh, this series and this book. That's all of those in such a good way. I think the the plot is really engaging. It's really creative and unique. I think the characters are all distinct and they're all really well developed. They're all unique and they're, you know, they just feel so, so fresh and so real. And the setting is phenomenal. It's just such a great take on London. It's obvious by the writing that Ben Aronovich has such a reverence for London. He goes into such deep description about the different streets and the history of London and everything. It's almost overwhelming at times when you're reading this book. Um, and another thing that I love about this book and this series as well is something that I recommend. One of the reasons that I recommended the Mustborn book was the magic system. I think that. The magic system and this is absolutely excellent i love that it is so grounded in reality and it mentions the laws of thermodynamics being tied to it and everything i just i think like the physicality of it and the weaknesses and the consequences being tied to magic is so interesting so yeah i i really i wanted us to do this book because it's slightly different from things that we've done but slightly the same uh, i think there's comparisons that can be drawn to like um neil gaiman's a Norse mythology book even because this book deals with mm. mythology I would say its own kind of mythology obviously there's a there's references to Harry Potter and it's kind of like sort of a grown-up version of Harry Potter and there's also um you know we could draw uh comparisons to Slow Horses because they both t- uh, set in London we can you know kind of compare them in that way so and they're cops cop yeah books. yeah so I just uh so before we go on to uh, more detail and more depth on our reviews, I just wanted to get your guys' overview on this series. Um, did you did you enjoy it? What were your feelings on it? Um, yeah, I, I really liked it. Um, just to touch back on the, the three points that you had, uh, what, what were they again? Uh, theme, symbolism, and plot. Plot, character, and setting. I would say you can add theme and symbolism, but I think they're. I think the the core is always the plot, character, and setting. Yeah, for in terms of plot, I I, I did, really did enjoy it. Yeah, um, I thought it was a bit slow at the start, but then uh, there was a moment where it sort of all clicked for me, and I was like, yeah, I'm really enjoying this actually. Um, so I was I was kind of worried at the start, and yeah. I was like, oh no, this is gonna be a bad <laughs> one. But uh, quickly turned around. Uh, characters, um, I sort of agree with what you said about them all being uh, well fleshed out and unique. But there's a couple of characters that I don't think are super fle- uh, like established. Uh, like Leslie, I don't think got enough um, time to be fleshed out properly. And some of the uh, old, like older police, but then they're sort of only there. Um, they don't really feature much, so it, it wasn't as big of an issue. Um, but yeah, I mean overall, I, I I did enjoy all the characters and um, thought it was it was really really well well written. So. And yeah, like you said, the the L- London is really well uh, written in this book. Uh, uh, even the like tiebacks to like the places in London and then characters, which I will touch on later. You know, like the I can't remember the names, like the geni- genius loci or whatever they're called, the the river people. Yeah, I thought I really liked that um, tie-ins. Like that was really nice. Um. Just before I ask Jonathan too, I just wanted to uh, add a point to what you were saying there. Uh, one thing I really love about it is how attached to uh, Peter's point of view the setting is evoked in. Like, it feels, it really feels like this is a cop describing London, 
Like the way that he's suspicious about certain things and activities that he's describing, it's really tied to his point of view, and I think that was really well done as well. Yeah, j- yeah. I just I, I was kind of like just like we like said there, you, you kind of got the like from a cop's point of view. But I I, I was kind of find myself thinking like, did he have? He obviously had input from like police, like you know, to write this book for for certain aspects. Um, so I was, I was wondering. Trying to find out more about that, if that was uh, a thing, but I couldn't find anything. Like, you know, if he did an interview or anything. I think that he did an immense amount of re- research for this book, to be honest. I, I think there was hours and hours and hours of research before this book. It's just what my feeling is. It feels very dense for such a such a short book. But um, we'll go on to you, Jonathan, there. What were your what were your thoughts on this book? Um, I thought this book was just okay. I didn't think it was amazing. I didn't think it was terrible. It was just somewhere in the middle. Um, I thought it did have good points. Um, the, the, there's a lot of sharp, witty kind of jokes, um, and remarks in the book. And I, what I did enjoy most was the narrator, um, which we'll talk more bites later but i just thought the performance was brilliant and kind of like you know made me laugh out loud a few times and i do think you know delivering those kind of remarks and like what he remarks is um was kind of based on the the way the narrator did it um but yeah i'll talk more about that later um but there was a lot of things that i didn't like about this book um a lot of the the constant uh, like sexual references and stuff like that i just find so jarring yeah. Um, I thought the plot was a bit over the place, all over the place. It was kind of, you know, they had this main case they were working on, but there was also these kind of side cases as well. Like, I'm a person that when I play Skyrim, I finish the main quests first, the main missions, and then I go back and do all the side quests. Do you know what I mean? Like, I'm like that kind of kind of way. Oh, I'm, to- I'm totally the opposite. Oh, you know, yeah. So I don't, <laughs> I, don't, I don't enjoy the kind of, like, occasionally stepping out from the main and going to some different, like, it, I just find it a, a bit jarring. I thought as well the magic, like I did, I I like the idea of this these wizard cops. Although you know, being from my guest the last time, um, I was very shocked that it was about wizard cops. But I actually did like that it was such a unique idea. But I wasn't a big fan of the magic system. I honestly found I didn't really think it was well explained. Or like I think they kind of tried to explain it using science a lot, which kind of defeats the purpose of it being magic. I thought like because magic is supposed to be unexplainable by science where it's more like just this is just science um but yeah we can go more into that as well but yeah um i just thought this book was just okay but just just to, just on something you said there like the magic magic part and science I, I i was taking it like the magic was like a branch of science like a yeah that sort of way but i i agree that it, it wasn't super fleshed out but i think it's gonna like in the later books michael you can maybe touch on this if you've read them but i feel like it's gonna uh, the later books are going to flesh it out more. Yeah, a lot of a lot of things. I know we have to we have to review this book as a, a an isolated book, obviously. But yeah, a lot of things that are are introduced in this book are a lot more fleshed out. Especially Leslie and Nightingale are a lot more fleshed out as the series goes on, because uh, Nightingale is it's kind of hunted that he that has history and stuff where it's he's kind of mysterious in this book. But uh, he definitely we definitely learn a lot more about him as the series goes on. And Leslie has brought a lot more front and center. I liked that Nightingale was really mysterious. I thought it worked really well for us, like yeah. who he was. Yeah. Um, just the one thing, Jonathan, you said about the the different plots. That's on. That's actually something I really love about this book. To be honest, um, I love uh, I love that it has the A and B plot, and that they kind of they interweave and they dance around each other. Like my, for example, my favorite episode of Black Mirror is the White Christmas episode, where it's got like these four different plots and then all of a sudden at the end they're all kind of tied together i think that is such an impressive thing to do in writing and i love when that that is pulled off it's so satisfying to me and the magic system again it's like uh i know what you're saying kind of you want a sense of wonder from magic but i liked I kind of like the juxtaposition, the way Nightingale viewed the magic as as this wonderful thing that didn't need explaining, and Peter was very meticulous and needed he needed to know because this is something that works within the universe. So surely it abides by the laws of thermodynamics, and that it has has these explanations. So I, I kind of liked I kind of liked that. It made it feel very real and physical to me. Yeah, 
I think that's just something you said there, just made me think. I think uh, one of the reasons I liked the, the, system, the magic system, and I never mentioned this, but I, I did really like it, was was kind of from Peter's perspective, where he's trying to like think around why th- certain things behave a certain way with magic, because that's yeah. how I, if he, you'll probably guess from the conversations we've had that I'm like that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so if it was me, I, I would be doing the same thing probably. I think yeah, I think he would be yeah. So I don't even I don't even do this part, guys. Uh, he's both had guesses as well. Um, did Stephen one? <laughs> don't think I have to go into much detail. You just she have said, to say what com- you see on the cover, guys. What that's, about that's the dead baby? Like, like the, I mean, there was a dead you, you baby. Cr- credit where <laughs> credit is due. You did get the dead baby, but Stephen said wizard cops and I also anything. said dog. So yeah. I mean, if we you know, if you could sum up this this book in two words. They're probably the perfect words, so yeah. It's... Wizard cops, dead baby dog. <laughs> <laughs> so you touched on it, Jonathan, and you said we'll get at it later, but I actually have it as my first point that I wanted to talk about, and I know we never do this, but I actually wanted to talk about the narrator first. Um, I thought, like you said, Jonathan, I thought uh, Kobna Holbrook-Smith did an absolute phenomenal job. He's very... I've read a lot of reviews of people that said he was a bit hard to get used to at the start and then they really loved him. It's definitely like an unusual kind of performance from an audiobook. It's very slow and he's got like the really, really deep intonation. Mm. But I, I was like, I was, uh, I thought um, for certain voices, like his uh, Henry Pike voice, I thought was amazing. This was, was like class. Yeah. Yeah. I thought this was like Peeves as a villain. We'll get more onto the villain more, but that's a, that's part of what I what I loved about this villain as well. But I thought uh, Cobno Holbrook Smith really brought him to life. I thought he was uh, great with Peter. I thought I thought his woman voices were really good. Yeah, I I, I, he I just agree, had yeah. such a great range and such a. I think he was like he, people talk about perfect casting for like movies and stuff. I thought he was like made to read this book. Yeah, I mean, I'd echo a lot of things you said there, but. Uh... I also just want to uh, make, mention that I think he is a Londoner, if I'm not mistaken, just by his like accent and stuff, which I think is a really good touch. You'll remember from our last book that I didn't like that the guy was. Yeah. And I think that that does definitely add another level to the performance when they're actually you know from the place that it's based in. Um, and then yeah I think his range was really 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 good like it, it could all the characters sounded unique I thought which which I love as well and it, I always like it when they actually do voices for the different characters rather than just you know the same voice as if it's like it's like um, you know it's like the same person speaking basically so I, I did enjoy his performance the, the, there was one thing problem that I had was one one word I noticed multiple times and I still don't know how to say it, but because I was looking it up, and he it it was it sounded to me like he was saying former, for like you know the spells. Yeah. He kept, I, to me, I thought he kept saying former, but it's actually like formai, like forma. Right. Right. And that because I, I I went to look it up to see you know if there was like a list a spell list because I'm that kind of person. And I couldn't find anything about it, and I was like, "What the, what the hell? Like, why, why? There's, you know, there's a Wikipedia for this book, but I can't find a spell list that doesn't seem right." And then I, I found out that I was searching for the wrong thing. So that's right. that's a small thing, but I mean, yeah, it's whatever. I think the the narrator was probably my favorite thing about this, and kind of really saved the entertainment value of the book for me. Um, I just thought there's just some like what I remarks that were written down and maybe if I read them myself yeah they would have been funny but I just think the way he said them it just actually made me laugh out loud like when I was listening to this book I think just like it was, like sometimes he would just be like doing like a voice I think there's a, one where uh, uh, Peter is like they in, in the bed with Leslie and it's just like and then I got an erection like it was just like so sharp and so he just like says it like straight out like so like dry and I just like I just laughed like hard at that, like, but um, yeah, there was a couple of points throughout the book like where that happened. Um, I thought like his accents, he does like an Irish and accent, a Welsh and a Scottish at some stage, and probably other ones as well. And I just thought they were brilliant. 
Oh yeah, I forgot about the accent, yeah. Y- yes, sorry. yeah, I just thought, and like, yeah, every character was was different. Like, and he he did like, yeah, some for the the villain, um, Henry. I, you know, did. It was almost like a creepy, yeah, like a Peeves voice. The way he would like um, think, like the way Stephen Fry does Peeves in the Harry Potter one. Um, yeah. It's it's it is like a like a poltergeist kind of like the way like a wee sneaky kind of tricksy or pol- like a jester. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. Um, no, yeah, I just thought it was brilliant, like, and, like, for narration, like, it's, yeah, it was one of my favourites, like, up there with Stephen Fry. Yeah, I would, I would definitely agree. Just moving on then, um, let's talk about the, the beginning of this book. So we are, uh, we're first introduced to Peter because he is assigned, uh, the, basically the, the police force is stretched fun when this murder happens in the middle of the night, and uh, Peter is only a, a probationary constable. At the point we were introduced to him, um, there there has been a brutal beheading in front of St. Paul's Cathedral. And he he and Leslie May, one of his fellow officers, uh, and who we kind of get from their dialogue together that they are friends as well. Uh, they're both on watch here. And then Peter sees a ghost, Nicholas Walpenny, who claims to have uh, witnessed the crime. Uh, there's a there's a bit of investigation onto what's happened. Uh, Peter kind of he he wants to confirm uh, Nicholas's version of events by using the CCTV. Just to kind of it lends credence to the fact that he has seen a ghost and everything. Eventually, he kind of returns to the scene of the crime. He this is where he meets Nightingale. Uh, he tells Nightingale that he he has seen the ghost and everything. So Nightingale quickly picks up that Peter has you know, has this sense, this magic uh, kind of gift. So uh, Nightingale recruits him into the smaller smaller division within the within the force. It's kind of like an X-Files-like department that the, the government are aware of and they oversee. So it's not it's not a secret from the government. Uh, Peter is brought to to a mansion nicknamed the Folly. It's like a kind of safe house. For them, this is where he meets uh, Molly as well. So Nightingale just basically tells Peter a lot of stuff about magic. He tells him all these things are real. I, I think it, as in it's, he says Isaac Newton is like the father of the of the magic. Um, what did you guys think of like this beginning? And as you kind of learned what kind of book this was going to be, as Stephen, you had it confirmed what your your guess was right, and Jonathan, you. The guess, you laughed at Stephen's guess, but then <laughs> you know you you wrote into the chat. I can't believe this is about wizard cops. <laughs> so uh, we'll start with you, Stephen. What did you think of the the beginning of this book? Uh, like I said, I, I thought it was a bit slow. Uh, you know the stuff about like uh, Peter not really paying attention to stuff, and he's like you know <laughs> reading signs and like plaques and stuff when he's supposed to be like investigating the, this killing. Uh, it was a bit slow i didn't know why that was included uh you know you know he's like reading like a a, a thing on a statue and he's not paying attention to what leslie's doing or something uh and there there was there's a lot of yeah it was a bit of a slow start but uh once the yeah, nightingale came on the scene and with the folly and everything it's i think it started to pick up a bit more then and uh yeah started to enjoy it a bit more uh yeah what else so the, the start yeah and and all the stuff about like um where he's for some he's got like you know he's attracted to Leslie and stuff, and they're in sharing a bed and everything. That was I didn't think that was necessary either, and it just I was kind of like, where is this going? Like, what, what, what? Um, is this like a romantic thing or like is it a mystery? What, what's, what's happening here? You know, it was a bit uh, hard to get into to start, but yeah. Um. Yeah. I mean, I thought, I thought the start was it was very like similar kind of Harry Potter style. Like it was kind of like everything's just normal, everything's boring. And then all of a sudden things just start getting weird. It's like, you know, he's just like out doing normal routine cop work. And then all of a sudden there's just a ghost there. And it's just, it, it, I'll, this is again another good performance by the narrator. Like where it's just kind of like, oh, there's a ghost there. Like, I mean, this isn't weird. You know, it's where you're, you obviously, it is, you're just kind of trying to keep yourself calm. Um, which I find quite funny. Um, but yeah, I did like that it was like kind of slow. And then just all of a sudden it just kicks off. Um. Yeah, just then uh, what Stephen mentioned to you about the like the whole like the Leslie thing. Like throughout the book, there's this weird like 
these kind of sex references I just did not enjoy. Like it, it was maybe like if you get one or two, it's funny and grand, but it was literally like any woman that came near him, it was like her breasts brushed up against me and it's just like every time. Yeah. <laughs> it's like there's absolutely no need for this, like, but this is kind of the beginning of it as well. Like it was doing it from literally the get go and like yeah, I just thought it was there was just too much of it. This was uh this was this is like a later point that I was gonna bring up later but we might as well get onto it now jonathan that you've brought it up a couple of times um for for my point i've wrote, read two words i've simply written horny ben because <laughs> i think that <laughs> i think ben aronovich was definitely on a i, I you know he, he was a bit excited when he wrote this book I, I think at times uh it was originally a like a of, Crazy, like a, a erotic fiction. Yeah, it's it, <laughs> it definitely reads like it at times. I think there's a moment when uh, Beverly, one of the uh, the the daughters of uh, Mama Thames, is gone swimming, and we get like a very exhaustive description of her. Um, have you guys ever heard of the the male gaze? It's no. it's like a it's like a thing in uh, Fulman mostly where there's a lot of like. Uh, focus on women and women's bodies like within Hollywood because it's so male centric the the creative people and the people behind the camera so and there I think there's a lot of uh there's a lot of sort of written male gaze within this book it's definitely a flaw I would agree with Jonathan about that and it does it's distracting nearly I think I think like you mentioned about the erection Jonathan and I think that would have been funny. It would have been funny as a one-off joke, but it happens multiple times. Yeah, it happens a bit too much. I think uh, to give give the book the benefit of the doubt, it does read like a male fantasy at times. And I think it's okay to write. I think it's okay to write an erotic male fantasy book, but I think this is marketed as a as a book that's supposed to be like a commercial book for everybody. So I think that's the issue. Yeah, I mean like think about it, like if i compare this to game of thrones game of thrones has a lot obviously a lot of like sexual references but it's like not awkward it's like this like happened naturally like this here just it's just it's just like every chapter there's like some mention of it and like it's always the same thing it's always like most of them are about like breasts like most of them are about like somebody leaning up against them or like bending over and it's just like very like it's it's a bit like uh pervy or something i don't know like it's it just doesn't like seem it's like it's like he's about pathetic Whereas, like, in Game of Thrones, it's like, you know, you know, you're know you just expecting, like, this to happen. It's, like, it's like natural, like, encounters and things. This is just, like, very, like, forced and the, like, you know. Yeah, I just, I just, it just doesn't suit this genre, I don't think. He also refers to Leslie as a WPC, which is a big no-no. Yeah, and this book was written in 2011, so it's not like we could say it's a product of its time or anything. It's, it's, a, it's a fairly recent book. I think, isn't there, when I first sees Mama Taves, he, like, talks about how he wants to go bleep 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 to her breasts <laughs> <laughs> now that, that was funny though I will say it's like a shock it's like almost like a shock that like I heard that and that's why I laughed at it but now, now I'm talking about it I'm like it's ridiculous like why is that on there <laughs> Ben Horney definitely I would agree <laughs> that's what I'll refer to him now if you see next time you're recommending one of his books you're not allowed to say his second name it's Ben Horney <laughs> another uh another controversy i think we should get into i think it's it's a worthy talking point about this book is that uh ben aronovich happens to be a white man peter is black there's a lot of there's a lot of stuff on twitter where people say that white authors should not be writing from the point of view of uh of black people or other minorities that that's their stories to tell uh we are we are free white men, so we're not like the final authority on this subject. I don't know. Do you guys have any thoughts on that? Or I'm gonna call out Twitter and I say that is absolute nonsense. Um. Um. Yeah. I think I think I would agree. Like. I mean. Uh, I, I mean. Was there anything super stereotypical in this? Like. I actually I mean, thought I... he handled. I actually thought he handled the race really well. There's a thing with um. There's a thing with writing the other, you know, writing from point of view that aren't your own, where you can make them like monolithic, where you can make like, if you write a gay person as a straight person, then you make the fact that they're gay is their entire personality, even though 
a real gay person being gay is just like one part of them it's just a small percentage of who they are but when yeah. when writers do it they tend to especially if it's if it's from they a point of view that's not there they, yeah yeah they tend to make it everything about them and that's what i think i think ben aronovich handled it really skillfully i thought peter's peter's blackness you know it's uh it's a part of him but it's not everything about him you know you can feel it him kind of steeped on a certain culture and a certain point of view i mean like i i don't know enough to say that it but it's it seemed like it was well researched again um i, I mean yeah i don't know I, i'm i'm kind of scared of talking about it to be honest. Like, <laughs> I'm trying to formulate this into a thought. Uh, I think that people like minorities and everything, their voices should be elevated more, and we should hear more from them. But we shouldn't, we shouldn't um, artificially inflate that voice by silencing or or like because it nearly feels like censorship to me again to say that you can't write a, a point of view yeah, black I character and everything. I feel I feel like it's a form of whitewashing. It's not exactly that, but it it feels close to that for some reason but again there's the whole question about like um appropriation of uh, culture and stuff that there's a whole debate there to be had that i don't want to have yeah because like, <laughs> like you said we're three white guys <laughs> yeah like where do you draw the line then i mean am i am i not allowed to I, i've written a lot of female characters in my own fiction am i not allowed to do that because i'm male or am I not allowed to do anybody who is not Northern Irish? Am I not allowed to yeah, write from yeah, any yeah. alternative point of view at all? It just it's it's kind of boxing on, and it's it makes me a bit uncomfortable. Yeah, I mean exactly what you said there. Like over where do you draw the line? Like it's it's the exact like same issue that's going on with it, kind of everything at the minute. Like it's just getting a bit ridiculous and out of hand. Like I mean, yeah, like if. I mean, if he's not in any way like making any mad like racist remarks or anything like that, then you know I don't see the issue. Um, and even still, like I mean, think about like I mean, Quentin Tarantino, like I mean, his movies are, <laughs> I mean, they're usually I mean Django, for example, the whole point of it is racism, like it's, yeah. and he's a white yeah, a, a white male, a like it's. Example, eh? Do you know what I mean? Like it's 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 I don't think like if you're, yeah, like just writing fiction. And you're not like you're not trying to embed an opinion in anyone to actually be racist or anything. Like you're just, you know, naturally writing a book. Like it, it doesn't really matter. I mean, the, what kind of characters you're portraying. Like at the end of the day, like he probably could have like easily just wrote that character as the main character Peter as a woman or a white male or any. Like you know, it would have probably still worked regardless. Um, so for me, it doesn't really matter anyway. Um, to be honest, like me and Michael talked, I didn't even know that he was a black man <laughs> until Michael told me. Um, I guess I just, I just don't see race. You know, it's just invisible. Like, um, you don't hear race. I don't hear race exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. This is an audiobook uh, podcast. Um, no, yeah, it's just. I think it's just about ridiculous um, that people would even people are just complaining to complain. To be honest, yeah, I think it's like a trend these days that people get upset about everything. Like so, yeah, you know, it's probably it's probably think? white males getting upset about that too. It's, it's, I know it's yeah. people. It's not even affecting that like get upset about it. Just they have something mm-hmm. to complain about. Well, he here's a thing, and let me just fact check this before I say it. But I think the narrator is black. So yeah, um, he is. I mean, he doesn't seem to have a problem with. I mean, like, too, I think about this book, like, I'm sure a lot of things are like this, but, like, the woman characters are, I mean, the male characters are better portrayed than the woman. Like, the woman Definitely, in this, yeah. I think, just because of like, Ben being horny, I think the women <laughs> are, honestly, they're all, like, supposed to be, it seems like all of them are good looking and have, like, big breasts and, like, yeah, <laughs> basically yeah. just, like, yeah. do you know what I mean? They're not, they're just, like, a very, like, male-designed woman. Like, yeah, it's not. definitely. They're not. Definitely. Like, they're, so, but, I mean... Again, should that be censored or taken out? Probably not, because it adds to the funniness. Or, well, for me, I didn't enjoy it, but like I'm sure there are people that do. So, it's it's okay. I I mean, it shouldn't be censored, but it's also okay for you to say that because they are not real people, that affects your enjoyment of the story. It's okay for you to say that as well. I think it's, but you know, it's it's still Ben Aronovich is allowed to to write that if that's what he wants. If he wants to write like a male fantasy where. Everybody is big-breasted woman, but obviously, <laughs> we can also call that out and say that makes the story worse. Yeah, I think like his like his uh, book isn't going to 
absolutely change the world or anything. No one's if you don't like it, if you're offended by it, then don't read it at the end of the day. Like it's not like this is like some politician or someone like implementing some official ruling on something. This is a man writing fiction, like so I mean it doesn't really matter. Okay, so on to on to lighter subjects then. Let's talk about the characters. Uh you guys have we've talked about we've touched on them and other sections anyway, but let's just go a bit more into um what it, so you guys kind of talked about Leslie, so I think we'll just put her to the side. We've kind of talked about Peter. Uh, we'll talk about more about Nightingale because we've only really touched on him. What did you guys think about Nightingale? I guess like Nightingale, um, of course, is he's like the from the car- compare with the Mistborn. He's like the Kelsier character. Um, the he's mentor, the one yeah. that's actually he's the mentor. Yeah, he's the Obi Wan Kenobi to the the Anakin. You know, he's yeah. he, he knows. Um, about this magic and like obviously you're 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 getting the point of view from Peter. You're as the reader, you know nothing about this universe or this magic system, and he's the character that kind of take, takes your hand and leads you through it. Um, yeah, I mean, I thought he was. I mean, he's probably the the best character in it for me. Um, most interesting because again, like he has this this kind of mysterious history, which of course you do get a bits and pieces looked into and stuff, but. Um, yeah, I mean, I think it's the book picking up, like as Stephen said, it starts slowly, the book picking up corresponds to the timing of him coming on, like, so I think it is his character that, you know, kicks off the, the madness, like, and yeah, I mean, it, it's, yeah, I think it was a good kind of partnership, him and uh, Peter as well, like, I like the dynamic. Yeah, they played off each other well, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, re- I really like Nightingale, he's like the kind of mysterious, uh, hard, uh, not you know not super easy going mentor type uh which i liked he's you know he, he's kind of um he's not strict but he's not like uh easy going with peter at all times and um uh, yeah I, I, but i did like the kind of sort of air of mystery around him like you know how old is he and and all this sort of thing yeah no i, I really liked him as a character too as a said he, he's he is the mentor character he plays that role well and He's very mysterious in this book. We just find out a few things about him, like how old he is, and uh, and I think the the way he his relationship to Peter is what makes him really interesting in this in this book for me. Next, I just wanted to talk about what I'm gonna term as the B plot. I I'm I'm just saying as I'm gonna term the A plot as the stuff with Henry Pike and the faces collapsing and everything. So we'll talk about the B plot, which I would say. Is about the the gods of the river, uh, Mama Thames story, Father Thames, all that stuff. So we find out basically that um, different parts of the Thames have these like these spirits, these uh, these people that are representative of, of ideas. It's very like we talked about this book before. It's a book that I've read and I talked about it on the Neil Gaiman episode that we did. But it's very reminiscent of American Gods. Neil Gaiman does this as well, where he uh, real people are attached to ideas. We find out that Mama Thames, uh, Father Thames, was he he was like the entire river at one stage, and then um, he kind of retreated out of the city as that developed. And then Mama Thames, she was like a Nigerian woman who who fell in, and she overtook this the city part of the Thames. She has a lot of daughters. We meet uh, Beverly Brook. Um, Lady Ty or or Tyburn as she's referred to in the book, who's a who's a sort of antagonistic figure towards Peter, whereas uh, Beverly is more of an ally for Peter. Uh, what did you guys think of this ki- this plot uh, and this kind of stuff in the book and these characters? And I, I did I did like the the B plot. Uh, one weird point that I want to just bring up is that the B plot is actually the source for the title of the book, which was kind of weird. It's the source. Uh, but one did... fi- funny thing, sorry, Stephen. Just one funny thing though is that it is the source for the UK title, but the American title, Midnight Riot, is more about the A plot. So that's just a funny difference. Yeah, I, I did find myself wondering, like halfway through, like where where is that going? Because obviously with the A plot, it's not really it's connected, but it's not blatantly obvious why i was like how how is this going to be how is this going to tie in it eventually does tie in but i mean i, I liked it it gave another like uh level to the universe you know where there's all these different uh people who are uh related to places like different rivers and yeah. stuff um 
I, f- I was trying to like place because obviously Tyburn is a river, uh, and, and some of the other, and obviously Mama Thames and Father Thames are both rivers, and some of the other characters that I can't remember are all named the same as a river. But I was wondering where Beverly Beverly Brook comes from. Yeah, isn't Brook Brook is it like a type of stream, isn't it? So maybe there yeah, is one it's a, called it's a Beverly. Type of body of water, yeah. It's a type of stream or body of water, yeah. But it's not like a because everybody else has a direct like name to a, a specific river where she doesn't seem to which uh, is just that's something I was trying to figure out as I was listening um, yeah I like I like how I, I wanted to find out more about how the sort of uh, society of these sort of spirits uh, is because you obviously you find out there's Mama Thames and she has all her daughters and stuff but but they're not really daughters sort of it's it was kind of there's a lot of mystery there that I wanted to find out more about yeah, uh, this is I think one of the problems I had with it was like kind of the jump in between the the plots and stuff. Um, like I mean, I think when I'm watching something like it's it is good to have like these side plots and stuff. I just found it a bit hard to follow. Like, this kind of like was a bit like that slow horses for me. I kind of got a bit lost with some of the things because of the switch in between them. Um, to be honest, I didn't really understand like what these rivers were supposed to be. It's uh, like I've just read a few things online. Like it's a, it's essentially like a a person who's like drowned in the river or something is like is the personified version of like each of the rivers or something like that so like the the yeah like so like the spear takes the form of like a person that's like died in the river um but it's just it's actually supposed to be like like each river that like feeds into the thames the thames being the main one is like supposed to be a uh, some sort of like god like has like a, a like an actual god like being on on earth or like some kind of god creature. I like I don't I don't really I still don't really understand what was going on to be honest. Yeah. Um, I, I thought it was a bit yeah a bit confusion for me like doing this part as well as the the main part. I I really I personally really liked it, but I I find the I find the a plot stronger, but I like the I like the the mythology behind it and everything, and it does feel very like mythology, whereas the 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 rules aren't quite certain, and it kind of. It, it just it's very similar to the stories that we were doing you know in Norse mythology with the Neil Gaiman book where you know these these things that sort of don't make sense just happen like a woman falls into the river and she becomes becomes the the mother of that river and you know the personification as you said Jonathan and I just liked I liked that element of it that it was kind of at that because you said that it was abs sort of the magic system you didn't say this but sort of implied that the magic system was absent of the sense of wonder so i thought this was kind of this was the sense of wonder in this book the the mythology behind it and everything so so we touched on the b plot there let's get on to the a plot so just to briefly go over it nicholas wallpenny tells them that somebody was beheaded they they see this on the cctv they confirm this that somebody just knocks the head off they go to, uh, they are eventually led to a man named uh, Cooperton, I think it was. They they go to talk about to his wife. She tells him about how a dog bit him on the nose. He's away on a business trip at the moment. He returns. He throws the baby out the window. He's, he kills his wife. His face collapses. We see this repeated throughout the book where people commit these very extremely violent acts. And then their face collapses and it's... It goes very, very graphic detail. As a horror fan, I really, I really like that. <laughs> I don't know if it was too dark for you guys. Uh, so it's just to investigate and why this has happened. Peter is coming up with these different theories, and then we we get this reveal, and I absolutely love this reveal. It actually sends shivers down my spine, like listening to this part where he's just watching the Punch and Judy show, and then um, and then he realizes, oh, this is what's happening citywide this play is being acted out with real people and it, then the music plays for the next chapter i thought that was absolutely brilliant i loved that but what did you guys think of of this plot um i kind of don't want to talk about the ending yet because i want to talk about the villain on his own well what about the investigation and stuff that it did it have you hooked or or not or it did it did it did have me hooked because it seemed like uh like obviously all the different pieces that he, he was coming across like the you know uh cooper town and uh what well, you know every everywhere he went it seemed like they, it didn't seem like they were super like properly connected it just seemed like for some reason people were getting really annoyed and 
snapping and then doing something really horrible like the lady in the in the cinema so it, it all seemed kind of disconnected and i was like well obviously these have to there has to be a link here somewhere so i i, w I was definitely on the hook the face thing i mean i didn't i, I didn't think it was amazing that you know the face falling off i didn't i didn't think it was super horrific i just thought it was kind of weird that it, or like what you know why why was just their face falling off <laughs> sort of thing well uh I, f I think the reason is um we we learn that uh that the magic it needs a power source this is why the phones keep uh breaking and uh the these phones keep breaking because it's drawn from the phones but when there's an absence of a power source when the magic is constantly on uh nightingale talks about how it like fries your brain and how it like it has all these consequences because it's drawn from the people themselves and we uh, i think we talked about before how Brandon Sanderson says like the the weaknesses are more interesting than the strengths, and I think this is a good example of that. Where I thought that was really really cool that you can't you can't like overexert yourself with this magic, or you can't do anything that's out of your power, or you'll fall apart. Yeah, no, I, I agree. But what, what I what I was to, what I meant was that while I was listening to the book, I was trying to think why are their faces falling off? What's that got to do with? So, but I did like it later on when it kind of ties back when. So, so Peter basically does all these uh, like experiments by himself because he realizes that uh, was it his phone that he that uh, kind of gets fried when he does his first spell and stuff. Uh, so he kind of realizes that technology is affected somehow, and he does all these experiments to figure out like uh, uh, you know how far away he can go and all this here. Um, so so when that started tying back and I was like oh yeah of course like what you were saying with the you know power source and everything I was like oh okay so the po the people are being like possessed and they're being drained of their power essentially yeah the plot was definitely a lot stronger um, and kind of again one of the things that did pull the book back up for me um, like I I like this this whole like uh, so the, the actual I'm going to break it into two parts the the actual fact that yeah, the, the reveal of it being um, reenacting of this play, I thought that was very. There's a, there's a show Dexter. I don't know if he's have ever seen it, but it's, it's like that. It's kind of very biblical. Um, like there's a, a season of Dexter. I think one of the so it's basically like he's hunting like a serial killer, and he's like the the serial killer's reenacting like the like uh like the horsemen, the four horsemen of the apocalypse or whatever something like that and it's like he's like doing all these like killings that are like themed by these different uh, the four horsemen or whatever um and that's what it was kind of like for me um it's, it's it's like these you know you're kind of working through this like biblical story almost and it was like a play in this case um but i really enjoyed that like i thought like it's kind of like you know where it's going and then you know where all oh, this is this is the next um stage of the play so we have to even though they don't know where it's going to happen they know what they look out for that's like you're just kind of wait, waiting. They start seeing the signs of this next. So I, I think that is kind of... Uh, it introduces a lot of suspense, yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, the second thing is, yeah, the, the face falling off. It was it was another similarity for me was if you've seen this latest season of Stranger Things, it's kind of like, uh, you know, they've been possessed. Um, like at Stranger Things, they're kind of possessed by the, you know, the, the villain and that. And like it's like at the end of it, they're going to die. And it's like, especially the part where Leslie at near the end of the book gets possessed... It's like um, Peter is like racing against the clock before this thing, before she her face actually falls off and she dies. Um, and I thought that again was a very uh, suspenseful kind of uh, part. So yeah, I, I enjoyed this uh, plot line a lot better um, than the the B plot. Yeah, I would I would agree that it was the stronger of the of the two 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 plots that were kind of twisting around each other. So I guess we'll we'll go on now to the villain. So it's about. It's a bit uncertain for a lot of this book who the villain is. Um, we're told uh, when Peter goes back to um, Nicholas Walpenny, uh, he tells him that it's a it's a man named Henry Pike, who was like a, an actor from was it the the eighteenth century? Yeah, I think it was. Yeah. So he was an actor, and he was uh, he was murdered by this uh, guy named Charles Macklin. Who is said to haunt the opera? We're told that that uh, Henry Pike, he's like he's kind of caught in this loop. Peter figures out it. We we earlier in the book we just to go back on things we find out that there's vampires and it seems like a kind of divergence from things. It kind of like wait what was that part even about? But it's I I think 
I actually forgot yeah. about that. <laughs> I think the reason for that was to introduce the idea of like vestigium parasites, like to introduce that concept. It was also, as I remember, where he starts figuring out about the another sign that uh, electric uh, objects get like fried. Yeah. Right. Yeah, exactly. So they they know that uh, Henry Pike is the the man. Kind of, he's carrying out this this punch and duty show. So they uh, they know that the next stage is where the the police or the constables or whatever they arrest. Uh, they come to arrest Punch. So Nightingale and Peter put themselves in this position where they're going to go arrest him. So they get a warrant from a ghost judge, and then they go to the opera house where they they believe that Henry Pike is going to uh, reenact the next moment of the puppet show, so they can finally arrest him and see through you know see through the play basically. But uh, Nightingale is shot at this moment. He is is in a coma on the folly. Um, Peter has to continue the investigation himself, basically. And he's wondering, you know, how how was uh, Henry Pike aware of this? Uh, There has to be like a common denominator who who give the information over. And this is where he realized that Leslie has been at the at the scene of every crime. And she's the only one other one who was privy to the information that they were going to act it out. So he realizes that Leslie has been possessed this whole time. So this kind of turns Leslie into like the villain character. And there's this, I thought this was a phenomenal scene where he goes to confront Leslie at the opera and he's like trying to tranquilize her, but he also has to act in the play to get near her. And then they like hang Peter and, uh, and we see that the entire crowd is like worked up into this frenzy and it kind of spills out into a riot within the street within London. Peter eventually heads home. He's very tired, exhausted. And that it's on it's on the journey home that a man starts laughing and he declares himself to be uh Mr. Punch. So I think this my interpretation of this anyway is that Henry Pike is not the villain, that there is a, another spirit, uh a malevolent spirit of riot and rebellion, as as it says in the book called Mr. Punch, who who is kind of inhabiting the ghost of Henry Pike. So I think Henry Pike is like an innocent spirit within this. And it's like, it's the spirit of, of Mr. Punch, who is the, who is the villain acting through Henry Pike. And I've already touched on, I think that, um, I think Cobna Holbrook Smith really, really helps bring to life this villain. And I, and I think I said like, it's like Peeves was a villain. He's just so mischievous and so maniacal and because we're always, trying to figure out what his motive is and we're introduced to different uh different workings of this world so we're like constantly questioning the nature of what he is i I just thought it was the best part of this book for me what did you guys think of like the whole the villain and the whole journey that we went on of kind of finding out who was the villain and what the nature of the villain was well the part where nightingale gets shot that's that sent chills down my spine you know where he's like he gets shot and then you hear the the vo- henry pike voice say um what does he say he says that's the way to do it or something and then when uh peter like uh levy corpuses him <laughs> by the ankle yeah. and uh I, I love that part and then the, the the journey of sort of going from that to um figuring out about leslie and the play and everything I, I i thought it was brilliant it was really well well done really well tied together um because then you could think back to all the other times um to like when leslie might have got possessed sort of thing um my guess is in the cinema uh but yeah i thought i thought it was really w- well tied together that now the part where it started falling away for me was was uh during the play and the, when the riots started happening, I think I missed something there uh, because all of a sudden, you know, they were doing the acting out the the punch and judy, and then uh, all of a sudden they were rioting, and I didn't follow why exactly. But I think you made um, clarified it there for a bit more for me, where you said uh, uh, the the violent spirit of riot and rebellion sort of overtakes the people in the crowd, and then they. Um, yeah, yeah. They, they ride, and I think yeah. that's where the American title uh, comes from. I think I think you're right. Yeah, I th- I think I like I like that the villain's just uh, like basically an agent of chaos, <laughs> where it seems like there's no real, um, you know, he doesn't have like really have an agenda. It seems it seems like he's trying to get re- Henry Pike's trying to get revenge for his death, yeah. sort of thing. Yeah, because he's you know he talks about. Um, 
uh, whatever the guy who killed him was called. He's waiting for him to show up or yeah, something. Yeah, because he was. Not going I think because it was said he haunts that opera. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So he's waiting for him to show up, and he and he doesn't. Um, but then you find out that it, it actually seems like there's, like you said, another spirit who's kind of just causing chaos, which I really liked. Um, and then le- later on, just to touch on something else, you said when uh, you know again to about the a separate entity spirit. Um, uh, later on in the book where when Peter kind of does that weird time travel thing that he does yeah. uh, with Molly uh, that um, you kind of I think the, the spirit of Punch the Revenant spirit kind of mentions that Henry Pike's gone now or something uh, and it's just it's just him he's, he's, I think he says you've killed me sort of thing but it's just weird because he's a ghost but like um, I think what he means is you've killed an aspect of me meaning the Henry Pike part but yeah, I, I I really like the the villain um, like twist and everything. Yeah, because I think uh, I think Peter confronts uh, a possessed Leslie after kind of after the time travel uh, moment, and and uh, Henry Pike is still with her, but uh, he's Henry Pike is no longer he's no longer under the influence of Mister Punch, and he kind of he kind of is seems like not to know what kind of chaos he's caused and everything. He's just talking about his performance and his legacy. He just wants to be a great actor. Yeah, so I think the, the Nightingale getting shot part, um, I think, I mean, the, the, again, comparing this to the uh, the Mistborn book we read, like, this is the same as, like, when Kelsier got killed and, like, it's, like, did Fem think she was ready? And this one, it was the same thing. It's, like, your mentor gets, like... In some way, like you've been going around with this mentor, and you can kind of always rely on them to like know what to do in a situation. But now, even though you've been trained and like you should be ready, it's like this is your first kind of test without them, and it's like you're straight into the deep water. That uh, um, that is a big plot point of like the hero's journey, which is like a yeah. plot structure that a lot of fantasy follows. It's like either the the mentor gets killed or the mentor is incapacitated. And on the Harry Potter books, Dumbledore always just goes away somewhere. <laughs> it's, it's like infuriating. <laughs> the whole uh, that Gandalf, uh, Gandalf yeah. 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 Yeah, it happens in like so many yeah, stories. Yeah, so I mean, obviously that's the 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 serving the purpose of that. I I the Leslie one, I think um, I enjoyed it because I felt like I knew it was common. I don't know, like if it was supposed to be made obvious, but it was kind of. I think there was a bit earlier in the book that was just kind of like you know. He did like say something like, "How did they know that this is going to happen?" Or something. It's like you know, once someone does does something like that, you're like, "Okay, it's an inside job." And then I was like, "Well, it has to be Leslie. Like she's the only one there." So I kind of did see that part coming. I just kind of felt so proud of myself, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I like the yeah the I thought it was the but uh, quite funny the where they were re- reenacting the play and he was like. Like he knew he was trying to like tranquilize her, but, but like trying to be sneaky and get on the play. But then you also knew that she was completely on them from the get go, um, and like it was funny how she <laughs> essentially got him, uh, essentially like got the uh, all her uh, like stage hands or whatever to like hang him. Um, but I think he was like hung with like a prop rope or something, so he wasn't properly like he wasn't going to die or nothing, and he gets away. Um, and the inside and riot part is actually again another comparison as I just recently restarted playing all the Assassin Creed games, and the first one was like the guy gets again with the apple of Eden and like possesses like all the assassins and like turns them against you essentially. It's yeah. kind of like that where like this is just like possession like a load of people do like inside these riots and just cause complete chaos. Um, which yeah, I I, I didn't enjoy that part. Um, I think it is. It was a bit for me. I didn't enjoy the fact that he just kind of like, you know, they chase him like out of the theater or whatever. But then, I think he like runs into some like family or something, like saves them, and then the, there's like a fire outside or something like that. And then like, uh, is it Beverly the wife uses her like power to like quench the fire yeah, or whatever? She likes some. And then he just yeah water. And then he just heads home like it's just like okay you've just like had this like almost like near death experience and like these people are after you and then you just go well, I'll just head home now like I thought that was a bit stupid. The way I, I interpreted that is another part of like the hero's journey is like a part after after the mentor dies or gets incapacitated. Usually there's a moment that I think it's called like the dark cave or the low point some people call it or it's just basically where the the hero is down in the dumps and has given up. And that's what I thought that that part was kind of trying to reflect that Peter's just like 
you know, I, I have no control over this absolute chaos. I'm just, there's nothing I can do. It was kind of him giving up. I just thought it was just like, God, you know what? I've been out all day here. I must get back to bed. <laughs> I haven't been home in a while. Jeez, I am shattered. <laughs> I just, is, is shift well, we'll, we'll pick is us he... up again tomorrow. Like. <laughs> is shift ended? Uh, you know, he's done for the day. Yeah. <laughs> can you take it home, me, it's, it's like there's all this chaos around him, and then it's just like, it hits like freaking eight o'clock at night, and he's like, ah, you know what? That's me done, sure. It's, someone, it's whoever. That's whoever's right. on now. It's their job. <laughs> yeah, that's about it. I, I, I I probably should talk about the time travel scene you talked about a bit, Stephen. This, this, yeah, I was going to yeah, say this book just goes kind of nuts. I think it's going to be a theme of books I pick where the ending just goes absolutely levels of bananas. But um, Peter gets he he gets a uh, bit by Molly. This causes some kind of magic reaction or something. That's I can't remember if this is ex- what ex- what what is Molly by the way? Is a vampire? That, is, is she like some sort of banshee vampire creature? She's like basically for the for for the listener, she's like the maid of the folly. She like cooks and cleans and everything, but she's also like some sort of she's also or... uh, she's some kind of creature. She just described as having like these really sharp teeth, and she has like this kind of feral, animalistic manner about her, the way she lurks about and stuff. And but don't they like they like set don't they set this up like to, so she like, they expect this to happen when she bites him like she they she wants him. Once heard about him, or is like yeah, because because Nightingale tells him about it, like he's done it before. He says sort it's of like thing. a one in f- one in five chance or something, isn't it? If it actually working or killing <laughs> Peter or something, isn't it? It's something like that. It's like she has this power to like basically suck his blood, and then he can go back in time <laughs> somehow. I, I don't know. <laughs> it's I like that. like you said, Michael Bananas. <laughs> yeah, I can't. But, uh, I can't remember <laughs> if that is ever explained in the future of the series. Um, to be honest. But yeah, yeah, she bites him, and this causes time travel. Isn't it like intentional then? Like so, like she bites him on purpose. But then, like whenever he wakes up after the time travel, like she's like still like trying to. So I think she's like turned completely feral and like yeah. comes after him or whatever. Yeah. Ah, okay. Yeah. I just kind of don't really understand what's going on there. Then if I was to, if I was to make up make up an interpretation to make it make sense, I would say that Molly gave Peter a, a near death experience. To, to cause him to become a spirit so that he could travel and pursue the, the, sp- ah. the spirit of Mr. Punch but I don't think I don't know if that's ever explained like that that's just what I would interpret to make it make sense in my head that's it that's my I'll, t- I'll take that like yeah, yeah. we're using that I don't care what the author thought like that's it. <laughs> I'll take that because it was that was the weirdest part of the book yeah. for me and yeah like I said it, it was kind of hard to follow yeah. it was kind of like the end of Space Odyssey I liked it just it, went, everything just went the different dimension and it was just all madness yeah <laughs> it's a it's a, I think uh, too the, like the, I love how um, well it's funny I think how uh, Peter chases him and then he's like I was so focused on him I didn't see what was around me and I, I kind of think that's like Ben Aronovich's way of saying I don't want to do any research about what this era was like or anything. I've I've done enough research for this book. I'm just gonna <laughs> smoke it. <laughs> I so so it's like there's a there's a chase through time. Yeah. So like he's chasing him, chasing Henry Pike or Mister Punch, I should say yeah. down, and it's like London's changing to it's, you know, uh, it's gradually rewinding the early twentieth yeah. century to the nineteenth. Yeah, because it was like pre-Roman times is where they end up, wasn't it? Because he's like the London Bridge wasn't there, which was yeah. in fact built yeah. by the Romans. He eventually runs out of track. Yeah, and that's <laughs> where he so finally meets uh, Father Thames. Yeah, at the like the kind of the the beginning of of London. Yeah, and that's where it all ties back together, right? Eh? Yeah, that sort of thing. Um, but yeah, uh, it was weird. Let's, let's leave it at that. <laughs> it was weird, but I liked it. But I liked it. Yeah. <laughs> can we, can we also talk about uh something I touched on earlier, which is uh Henry Pike and um, I can't remember what his name. The ghost at the start. Uh, Nicholas Wallpenny. Nicholas Wallpenny. Can can we also talk about like obviously? So it's revealed that Henry Pike and Nicholas Wallpenny are one and the same. Yeah. But why does Nicholas Wallpenny like alert uh, Peter basically to the whole, like ghosts and stuff? Why, what's what's that about? Uh, What's your theory there? My again, this is this is again just my head canon. It. I don't. I'm not saying at all. This is what the book was intending or anything. My interpretation of it, anyway, is that 
Nicholas Walpenny was not aware that he was doing anything wrong, so he didn't think that like this uh, this information about um, Henry Pike was was confidential or anything. But then again, I think like why didn't he tell Peter that he was Henry Pike? So that theory doesn't really make sense when. Yeah, well, I've I've been thinking about it during the the course of the episode here, and uh, I think that he did it because to to fully reenact the play, he needs a cop. Right. Yeah. To try and arrest him. Right. Sort of thing. Right. So he sort of tried to kick it off. That oh, way. that's a, that's actually a, that's that's really good. Actually, that could probably be it. I would say. But it's, yeah, it's never it's never explicitly said. Yeah. So I was just I was wondering what you thought. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think that mm. that makes a lot more sense than what I said. And he's also chaos. He's he's like Littlefinger. Never always keep your foes confused. Yeah. You know? <laughs> <laughs> If they don't know your true intentions, they can never uh, Wait, bitch you, basically. Uh, I Sansa. My, I think my favourite... Uh, Sansa. <laughs> I think my favourite reoccurring joke through this is how they keep referring to uh, Peter as, as having a science background when he got, like, C's A-levels on... <laughs> I know, yeah, yeah. <laughs> hey, for, if he got a C, like, he's doing a lot of experiments <laughs> and stuff, I think he should have got a bit more than that. Yeah. Uh, I thought that was funny. Uh, let's just go on to our rating section. We're going to mark this out of five. Yeah, uh, sure. So, uh, as I said a couple times, I really liked it. Uh, I, I, I didn't think at the, at the start, the first maybe hour or two, I didn't think I was going to like it the whole way through. But eventually, like I said, had that sort of uh, eureka moment where it just all clicked and, yeah, I was, I was on the hook. Um, <clears throat> so, I, I think I'm going to give it a four. There were I did have a few gripes with it, like the time travel bit and a few other points um, that we may have mentioned. But overall, I think I enjoyed it enough to give it a four. But that there was something I think missing, and there were a few holes or plot parts that I didn't agree with. That means I wouldn't give it a five, basically. But I, I really liked. It. Yeah, um, I, as I said, I thought this book was just okay, somewhere in between the middle of. Um the five and the one um so i'm going to give it a three um which is smack bang in the middle um the narrator definitely pulled it up a lot for me um and all, all the plot a was quite good um but i probably would have preferred just the plot a uh, not like this massive side plot b as well um and yeah the the worst thing for me which i just really hated was just the constant uh, sexual references like I just I just hated it <laughs> um, yeah so a three from me yeah uh, I, I do agree with the definitely with the sexual references Jonathan and I do think that is a, a big flaw in the book so I'm not discounting that at all but I, I just I, I can't I, I kind of disagree I kind of agree with my original statement of like that this just just nails everything on the trio of uh plot set and character for me although i i do think plot a was stronger but plot b introduced all these great mythologies and everything that i find so fascinating and it's re- the reason that i've returned to this book over again uh because it because it is flawed and i i don't think i think i think the series improves as it goes on i don't think this is the best book in the series by a long shot but i think it has a great start to the series and i so i can't give it a five because it does i do acknowledge the flaws but if i think i would give it the next best thing i think i would give it a 4.5 it is a book that i really love and i probably will go back to the series now and finish it as it is up to date okay so that was our rating section comparison to other media so i've already talked about this this like makes a lot of references it references sherlock it references harry potter it references star wars peter is a bit of a nerd uh i think he's definitely that definitely reflects ben aronovich's interests he is 100 percent the nerd because of his other works that i'll touch on <laughs> i've i kind of talked I, I think this it was i wanted something between harry potter and sherlock I was really looking for something like this, and I think this series really scratched at it. So that's pro- that's where I would draw comparisons. Uh, as for like adaptions, this this has been and talks about having a TV show made for years and years. It's still a pretty new series, so I think I think it as a matter of time before this is adapted into something. Um, but 
is there any comparisons you want to draw with this? Um, yeah, Harry Potter, uh, Slow Horses, any sort of London-based cop show or or media, I think is definitely a big hitter. Um, not sure. I, I haven't really thought of thought through about like, the comparison part. <laughs> no, no worries. Anything for you, Jonathan, or will you move on? Uh, no, just simply anything with wizards or cops. <laughs> Cop wizards. Dresden Files next is my next pick. It's why, uh, it's why like, uh, somebody punching Judy. I don't know if you've ever heard about that. Or heard about that. Uh, it's a bit of a rip-off, if you ask me. Uh, no, it's very derivative. Yeah. But, uh, okay, so Stephen mentioned that he has trivia. I have none apart from the trivia I spoiled at the start. Yeah, that was one of them. Um, <laughs> just uh, so you mentioned that he that he's a big nerd, or it seems that way, and it definitely from looking at his like other works, Ben Ben Aronovich, it's clear that he is because he's uh, he's written Doctor a well-known Who, episode of Doctor Who. Yeah, uh, Remembrance of the Daleks. Uh, it's a big big one. He's also written uh, a few others, I think, and he, he's done some of the um, audio dramas for for Doctor Who as well. Um, but also, I saw somewhere that he's written for Blake Seven, <laughs> which is a uh, uh, like a, an old. I think it was the seventies, actually, like a seventies sci-fi. There was a really famous, or not famous, but really class metal song about it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's where I know it from. But uh, he, he's written for that, or at least like done some audio dramas for it or something. So he's involved a lot in the sort of science fiction fantasy genres a lot. Yeah. So I think anybody who writes for those is, by definition, a big nerd. Yeah. So. A lot of a lot of a lot of people uh, seem to have like starts in Doctor Who. A lot of British writers, or especially yeah. like people who sci-fi fantasy kind of sphere. Hmm. We we touched on it a couple of times that the the novel has two titles, right? One for the US, which is Midnight Riot, and then rivers of london which is out for everywhere else i assume i think so yeah. uh, so like w- why why do you think that they change titles like for different countries what what's that about obviously you know harry potter and the philosopher's stone is a famous one that is, but, yeah. but like why 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 is that or why do you think that they do that i think it is i think when a decision like that is made it's usually money is the primary motive and for some reason and I cannot understand why they would think this, but they they would think that Americans are more likely to buy a book called Midnight Riot than Rivers of London. Maybe they, maybe they, you know, uh, books that have like different places names in them don't test well in America or something. Hmm. And it's like you know nobody nobody in America wants to read a book that's called Rivers of London or something like that. Uh, yeah, that's my only guess. I know the the Philosopher's Stone one was that um, you know, people they they changed it to Sorcerers Dunley for America yeah. because they were afraid that uh, people wouldn't understand, you know, that what a philosopher was or what relevance it was or that it was a magic book, but it's got philosopher in the title. So yeah, I think it's just like the motivation is nearly always a marketing kind of thing, and they just think this title will sell more books than that title. Mm. Okay, yeah, I mean, it's just, it just seems really weird Does, to me yeah. like, that the, they also changed the cover, obviously, because the 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 cover that we looked at um, has uh, you know the rivers and the different place names and stuff, but the the U.S. cover has I assume it's uh, Peter and he's got a a fireball looks like in his hand and a gun. Yeah, I'm looking at it and I am Wikipedia. It looks like it looks a lot more pulpy than yeah. Than the one the UK and one. To be, to be honest, I think if I saw this cover, I'd be less likely to pick it up. Than really, than yeah. I saw the other one. It seems uh, kind of, it, it, it kind of looks like an action book. It, it doesn't really doesn't. I I don't think state the genre very well. No, I know he has the fireball, but it's all it's kind of easy to must too. Yeah. And that actually just reminded me of the other piece of trivia that I had, <laughs> and uh, so this the US cover. Right. Um, apparently, there's different versions of it. Some where the face is obscured, the face of Peter is obscured, and on other other copies, like the original, is 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 you know it's it's not obscured. So like like 
basically blacked out. Yeah. Um, and apparently it was accused of whitewashing. Um, right. Doing that. Yeah. Yeah, I can. Which is interesting. Yeah, I can sort of see that. Yeah. Wonder why they why they did that as well. But I think I think in the latest editions they've corrected it so that you can see that you know Peter's full face basically. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um. Uh, so I I mentioned earlier about Beverly Brook and the the river names. Apparently, Beverly Brook is a minor English river in southwest London. Okay. That's yeah. his full name. Right. Ah. Oh, okay. All all makes sense. So like. there we. There we go. <laughs> Everything's right with the universe again, yep. so there we go. All has been set right. So let's go on to what we are consuming. Um, so I've been watching the Oscar nomination films, um, I said. So I think last time, um, what did I not watch? I watched, so since then, I think I've watched the film Tar um, from this year's one. Uh, but of a weird film, again, it seems like a lot of the... Uh, Films seem to just be these kind of weird underlying message films. Like, it's strange. Uh, Michael, you said there's some kind of name for that, like Oscar bait or something? Oh, yeah. There's when a, when a movie is specifically written to to win an Academy Award, like it's, yeah. Uh, like, it's it's usually like some kind of like, um, like I think that the film was like mostly, it was, it's kind of like about uh, her like unraveling over the film and like just kind of falling apart her life and stuff like from being like such a successful yeah. person or something but something you will yeah, I mean, something you uh something you'll notice jonathan as you go through that list is there's a lot of, there's a couple of themes that like the the people in the oscars really love and one of them is like an artist who's really obsessed and that obsession ruins their life another one yeah. is another one is like they love movies about making movies like the fablemans they love movies like that yeah. they love self-referential movies about hollywood yeah um so watch that i thought it was okay maybe a six out of ten um and i watch i've can almost watched the fall of the power of the dog which i think is quite is it's quite good um so that's where i'm at and watching the oscar movies i'm also um watching uh i've I just finished that tv show wednesday um you know the adams family one um i actually thought it was quite good um quite a good ending and yeah, I would recommend if you haven't watched it. Um, it's, it's kind of a funny show as well. Um, yeah, to be honest, not, not really much else. Um, I've been reading Game of Thrones, Dance of Dragons as well, or like listening to the audiobook of Dance of Dragons. Um, but it's 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 a long one. Um, do you know what? I, I think that this is a thing, maybe a good question to ask. Um, like, do you like whenever like chapters of like an audiobook's like shorter and like ten say ten minute listening time, or do you yes. not mind like the big forty minute like Game of Thrones chapter? It depends. It depends what it is for me. Like if it's if it's a certain POV in Game of Thrones, like for example, if it's a Jamie chapter or a Tyrion chapter or someone like John or someone, uh, I think I I don't mind it so much. But if it's like like a Brienne chapter, I'm like oh god i know uh, that's probably it's probably because i it's game of thrones and like that's the way it does it because it's like you're getting like 40 minutes of like the same character yeah also also daenerys i find hard to to listen to a lot Um, yeah i don't i don't like daenerys either um cersei's a good one i think because there's a lot of plotting going on uh and yeah like i said it depends it depends um for pov books whose pov it is but in general, like for example, in Rivers of London, I think I would prefer like shorter chapters. I like a good, I like a good short chapter too. I don't like too short. I don't like um where some thrillers, it's like the chapter is literally three pages, which would be like the audiobook equivalent to like five minutes. I think that's feels a bit too short to yeah, me. Yeah, too short. Yeah, yeah. I like a good yeah. twenty minutes, twenty minute kind of region. Yeah, I, I'm the same. I, I, because I would usually listen to a few different things at once, and like rather than like. Say if I only listen for an hour a day, like in total, then that's like one chapter Game of Thrones. Whereas if it's three twenty minutes chapters, I can listen to three different books in one day. Yeah. Which is even though it's the same amount of time, it just feels like you've listened to more. Um. So yeah, yeah I, I guess prefer the shorter chapters. But um, I was just interested to see what you thought about that. But I think that's uh yeah everything for me. Um, I'm doing more um 
other kind of stuff at the minute. Um, I'm actually <laughs> funny. Just every, every week, I feel like I'm doing some learning something enough different. Like last time, I think I was saying I was learning piano. I've now uh, started doing some gardening, <laughs> growing uh, <laughs> oh, nice. a tomato plant. Um, nice. So I want. I've always I've always wanted to like grow my own food and like eat it. I just feel like it would be better. You know, if you made it yourself, even though it's just going to taste like, yeah. So yeah. I've got my first plant, and yeah, we'll we'll see how it goes. I'll, I'll maybe give, uh, you know, an update every ep- every episode we do on this <laughs> on how the tomato plant's getting on and what, what stages of growth it does. It's just a pity what um what climate we live in. It's kind of limits your I know limits um, certain things that would grow. Yeah, there's like a lot of. Uh, stuff we can't grow here but they're fair like with greenhouses and stuff you can't like and you can even get a heated greenhouse which is you know that's that's the that's the absolute dream goals way down the line but you know what the minute we're just starting small here <laughs> you've been looking on dead have you <laughs> oh jesus big drop irrigation system and everything like you know it's but right now i've just got one pot um and we uh, we one spade and we uh water and sprayer so you know start small and before you know it they'll have a, an absolute empire <laughs> <laughs> um, of tomatoes yeah. just a tomato empire um but yeah just um so i've been like watching a lot of like youtube videos and stuff on that um nice just because i literally know nothing about it like it is it's <laughs> actually like there's so much goes on there like um like just like trying to grow a simple plant like. i love that I, w- I wish i had the drive to do that as well you know i just don't but <laughs> sadly <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I think I think I mentioned in the last episode that I was trying to watch Dragon Ball from the start, which uh, kind of fell off because my uh, so I have like a external D- DVD drive for my computer and that's not working, so I couldn't start that and it really annoyed me. Oh. Uh, so I bought I bought I bought the first uh, like season DVD and I haven't been able to watch it, which isn't really annoying. Uh, and then, uh, because I couldn't watch that, I was like, oh, I need something to watch. So I started watching Peep Show again <laughs> for like the fifth time. Just uh, easy easy to watch while you're doing other things and really, really funny. Uh, I watched all of the John Wick films, obviously, in preparation for our uh, visit to go see John Wick 4. Um, I'll say no more about that. Uh, finally watched everything everywhere all at once after Michael kept recommending it and I thought I loved it oh really <laughs> did you love it yeah I, I loved it yeah I thought it was so stupid but <laughs> it's sort of stu- stupid in the way that like you know how Doctor Who is really stupid but yeah. it's still really good yeah like that I was getting those vibes from it yeah. and, and I really liked it uh, where things things sort of kind of don't make sense but they do but not really uh, I I I, re- I really enjoyed it. I thought it was so funny and uh, entertaining. Yeah. Um, what else? Uh, I went to see Dungeons and Dragons last week. Oh, uh, nice! It's really good, by the way. Oh, really I've heard good, good things. Uh... Um, yeah. A uh, lot of me, me, myself, and Michael have both played the game, uh, and there's a lot of things uh, like fan service in it, Michael. That uh, it's really good. Nice. Um. I'm trying to find the time to watch Barry, uh, which is a show that our friend Jason recommended to me, um, which is about, uh, I think he said it was about a hitman who goes into like drama school or like acting classes or something, which I thought was a really funny premise. Uh, but I, I, haven't, I haven't managed to find the time to, to start that. Um, what else? So then, on the gaming front, I've been playing a lot of Divinity: Original Sin, which is like a turn-based RPG fantasy kind of game. Really, really fun. Doing a lot of back on back on the muck with uh, <laughs> World of Warcraft. Uh, playing classic hardcore, which is just it's just a game that you play if you hate yourself. <laughs> uh, basically, if your character dies, you have to delete it. Uh, it's it's just it's yeah. I hate myself so playing that. Uh, still listening to Face for Crows and it's it's a slog. <laughs> like much like what Johnny said about Dance for Dragons, it's it's a long one. Uh, and there's a lot of chapters where it's like, oh my god, here we are again. <laughs> where I'm kind of half a, listening. A brand chapter. A brand <laughs> brand. Um, I have. There's no. Th- thankfully, there's no brand in Face for Crows, so that's good. But. Oh. I'm dreading getting to dance. <laughs> oh, you're looking. <okay. laughs> 
Uh, if, uh, oh yeah, and I think I mentioned last time too that I'm, I'm starting to learn Golang again. Uh, I'm still continuing on with that. I do, but try and do about every night just to to, um, to keep up with that. So for the listener, it's like a programming language um, made by some folks from Google, and it's uh, it's really fun. Yeah. Um. So I spent the last week in Newcastle and England, so I did not get to watch many things the last couple of weeks. Uh, I, I did have been listening to some music. I haven't really talked about music on this podcast before, but um, one of my favorite bands are called The National. Uh, they have released some new singles. Uh, they released a song about five days ago called Your Mind Is Not Your Friend, which is featuring Phoebe Bridgers, who I, I she's, oh, yeah. she has... Uh, I think it's Punisher you call it it's a really great album she released a few years back and I really love this song and I can't wait for their new album I've also been listening to a couple of audiobooks one is one that I haven't listened to before and one that I have and they're sort of related one is by I don't know if this is how you pronounce his surname uh, Peter Adia it's called Out Love And it's basically about like the science behind longevity and what he calls the four horsemen diseases, which are, um, I believe, diabetes, heart disease related diseases, um, cancer and neurodegenerative diseases such as Alzheimer's, dementia. Um, And it's basically what he's kind of trying to uh, reverse engineer kind of what what causes these diseases and what what genes are present in centenarians, people who make it to 100 and beyond, that kind of make them so resistant against getting this. Let me guess, they grow their own tomatoes. <laughs> there's there's no, it's not really a sample answer book, to be honest. It's He talks a lot about medication different, and like different research that's going on. One really um, interesting one that he was talking about is like rapamycin which is derived from Easter Islands. I think it comes from the soil because the people there believed that like the volcano had healing properties. So then they actually got this medication from the soil. And then they, uh, this, this drug is now given to people who receive transplants. And there's a lot of like talk about how this could be, this could mimic certain genes that uh, make people live longer. But uh, obviously that isn't very useful to a lot of people who can't get rapamycin so there are there are actionable things that he talks about in the book and an obvious very obvious one is um exercise is very good for staving off neurodegenerative diseases especially talks about like unpredictable exercise like boxing and I, i would say a lot of sports where you're you're not it's not as repetitive as say an exercise that i personally love is running that's a kind of repetitive it's it's Kind of, it's more challenging to do unpredictable movements. Um, he talked about like how calorie restriction is really good for heart disease. Uh, something that I do as well is is fasting. Uh, he, he talked about how how that is very good because it mimics it mimics calorie restriction and in, in certain periods. And it uh, I don't want to bastardize the science too much. I would just I would highly recommend reading the book. It is compl- It was really fascinating. I'm still halfway through it. Another one that I have been listening to is The Obesity Code um, by Dr. Jason Fung. He is a nephrologist, which is a kidney doctor. Uh, this book is all about like the science of like all these diets that have happened in the 90s and noughties and 80s, how like fat was originally demonized and this brought about the rise of sugar. Uh, and then people were saying, no, actually cut out carbs. I was kind of talking about the science of why these diets worked and why they didn't work and kind of it talks about like the hormones that are responsible for fat burning and then and then he just talks about at the end there's like this footnote of like oh you could you could fast to like uh to make these hormones work uh, to better regulate your hormones and it's something that i've i did to lose a lot of weight uh, and you know to keep myself kind of metabolically healthy it's a and it's a book i always return to to kind of remind myself about the science of of why I did that and everything and why I continue to do that as a lifestyle. I don't do it all the time because sometimes, as he talks about in the book, there's times to feast and there's time to fast. So sometimes I just like go crazy and eat. Then everybody like says, how do you eat so much? And that's the answer that I, I fast at other times. 
but uh yeah there are two books that i'm making my way through at the moment uh as for working on things uh i haven't really had a chance to work on on many things because because i was away but i finished the first like part of my serial shadow sisters and i'm working on possibly another podcast i'll talk about later uh when it's when there's a bit more background done on it but yeah i'm still working on that at the minute and working on other things all the time just bits and pieces when i have more hopefully more to report next episode we should probably like uh bring up the fact that we have an email uh if you want to email and recommendations or anything like that we're happy to or or anything you want us to read out on the show we're happy to do that as well um we'll put it on the show notes there we have a twitter that we don't really use that much at the moment hopefully i can get better at going back and like doing episode promotions at the moment just don't i don't really like twitter to be honest but i'll try try to be better at using it okay um so i'm just going to uh end my episode here and pass the mantle over to Stephen. he'll be doing our book recommendation for the next episode Stephen, if you want to go ahead with that sure so um uh, so this time uh, i was kind of thinking about what to to recommend and uh, i decided to go with one that i've not read before and it's actually one of our uh listener requests uh so it's the thursday murder club by richard osman um, nice. We'll do a, a plot guess in a minute if anybody if you just haven't read it. Um, but yeah, I, I kind of yeah, I I, 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 I I had a hard time thinking of what I wanted to recommend, and there was a few things that came to mind. But like I said before, I wanted to stray away from the sci-fi fantasy sort of genres, which is where all my recommendations naturally would come from. <laughs> So I, you know, I say, as this is this is a book that I've seen a few times, like shopping and stuff. It's still on the shelves. It's a very, um, very it's popular like, book. It's very, very, very popular, very recent book. Yeah. So, um, I see it every so often. I think, gee, geez, I would love to to read that. It's it's it must be good if it keeps um, you know, popping up sort of thing. So so yeah, that's that's uh, I guess that's spoilers for the next episode. But that's why I picked it anyway. Um. And yeah, so it's The Thursday Murder Club by Richard Osman, and it's narrated by Leslie Manville. Uh, it comes in at about 12 hours, but I think like the last half, or the last 50 minutes or something is a Q&A with Richard Osman, so. Do you want to have a guess at what, what it's about? Now, obviously, the, the title is very descriptive, so I'm going to need a bit more to, to say a correct guess. Can I go first, just because... I want to say I think I I might know some things about this book even though I haven't read it. Um. So I'm not I'm not a hundred percent sure if this is all true, but this is what I think I know about the book. Um. I think that the third in the series came out there recently. I think I think you're right. Yeah. I think uh I think it is a cozy mystery. I'm not really sure what a cozy mystery is, but I think I have heard it described as a cozy mystery. Um. I think that I think that it is about no actually I don't I don't I was gonna say I think it's about a book club but I, I don't know that to be honest I, I think that's a projection so uh, yeah that's basically everything I, I know about it so probably not that much what okay but let's what, so what are you saying your guess is a cozy a cozy mystery just so <clears throat> let me think first day murder club I will say that it is these people, they, they're they like true true crime fans or something. They're like obsessed with uh, murders. And they just, they're like normal people. Nobody's from like a crime background or anything. They're just regular people who get together and they discuss these, they discuss these morbid, they've, they're all like morbid curious and they discuss these crimes and things. And then they get like, I think the plot is probably about them getting entrenched in one where they're actually starting to solve it or they're, they've stumbled onto something that, that pulls them into, into a position where they can kind of actually uh, actually figure out this mystery. That's what I think it's about. Johnny, what, what do you think? Um, well, Richard Osman, I know I wa- used to watch Pointless a lot back in the day, so I know what he's... he's I'm assuming it's some kind of comedic book, and you know? I like. Is, do, can you tell us the genre? Is it, is it, is it comedy? 
or would that be giving it too much away? Um, I mean, it's not a comedy. It's not. Okay. Do, do, yeah, I can I can give you the genre. It's a crime. It's a crime book. It's a crime. Okay. I don't um, think that spoils Michael's guess. Like no, because Michael's do fair walls doing the cream right now. Um, I think similar to Michael, I do think it's like some group of um, yeah, people that are like either like this kind of crime or this the kind of intrigue of murder. But rather than them like going and solving it, I think they're the ones that commit the murder. They like actually they actually <laughs> like it so much that they want to you know try it out. So I'd say that's maybe maybe the difference between my, me and Michael's then is oh, yeah. you can hopefully distinguish between them. Okay. By the way, I don't know if either of those is right or wrong, but that second one's funny to me. Oh, you actually <laughs> you you don't haven't read what the plot's about now. No, I I, I haven't read it now, so yeah. I, I don't know what it's about. But the sec- I hope it's the second one. <laughs> <laughs> that kind of yeah, that would be. And then thing. it obviously happens on Thursday or something. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> They meet on first. Oh, no, it's the, the Thirsty Thirsty Murder Club. Sorry. No, it is. The, it is Thirsty. This isn't my guess, but it, it could be it could be like murderers like that are that are just meeting together on a first day. And it's like uh, just like a mundane kind of meeting. But obviously they've done horrific things or something. But I understand. Yeah, like, it's, my, like it's like my first the club guess, is like, uh, a, like an AA meeting. And like yeah. they're meeting, they yeah. discuss their, their murder. So. I'm John and today I... <laughs> I murdered six people. Just it's like yeah. it's like the the sharks and finding Nemo. It's like that. <laughs> yeah. I would show you the cover, but it's not. There's nothing really on it. Like I, it's I just, think I've seen the cover. I yeah. think I've seen it too. Yeah, I've seen it too. It's the title, and then I think that's a wolf at the top. But I'd, I mean, I think the title is so so descriptive. They didn't really have to do like a a strike in nah. the cover. Okay. So yeah, that's that's the book for next time. So it's the Thursday Murder Club by Richard Osman, and it's narrated by Leslie Manville. Nice. Okay. Happy days. Happy days. Right. right. That is uh, that is episode eleven. Uh, that is us. I guess we will uh, be be listening to Stephen's pack then, and we will see you next episode or talk to you next episode. Goodbye, everyone. Hi. Goodbye. Goodbye.